Yehoshua. Um, the last few prokim. I just created a little library for myself here. I don't have the same space. Could you move that, Susan? Please. It's a frying pan. Here, leave this. Uh, leave this here. Leave it with the other people. Okay. But I think it's no. Okay. Why don't you go with her back? Bernie, is it cold up there in Santa Barbara that you're wearing a coat? No, you know, we were out. No, it was, it, it was like 75. It's very nice. But we were. We ate outside. We ate outside. It was a little, little chilly outside. On the balcony. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. So we left off uh, right before Perak Um And I want to. So we're going to do Chaf Aleph, Pasuk Mem Aleph. Mem Beis and Mem Gimel. If you remember last week, we dealt with the 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 Are Halviim, the Are Miklat, and the cities of the Levites. So the 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 final psukim, the final psukim of that parak says, "Vaitena Hashem liYisrael kol haaretz Hashem yishbal latet lavotam." So Hashem gave Klai Yisrael the whole land that He promised. And they inherited it. He wiped out all the enemies. Nothing was undone that which Hashem promised them. So, the Gemara in Baba Kama, in the first parak, quotes the pasuk by Tein Hashem Yisrael Kol Hashem Yishba Latet Lavotam. Says the Gemara, Asar Tzmaim Hisna Yoshua. Hashem made ten Tnaim with all the Shvatim. How the uh, sort of public laws that would govern how Klai Yisrael would live with their neighbors. And the Gemara goes through the following. Number one, Shiyu mirin behemot biarim chalacherim vein reshut labal ayar lakpid Any Jew could take his flock and pasture them in anybody's forest and the owner of the forest could not be makpid that, w- that means even though we've ge- we've gone through all of these chalokim, Binyamin, Yehuda, Naftali, Asher, everybody has ha- everybody has their area, and let's say somebody was given a forest, and that belongs to him, but if you are coming along, you are ha- you are, let's say moving your flock from the territory you live in to uh, like they used to. They used to take the, all of the, the steer uh, from Texas to Chicago, to the slaughterhouses in Chicago. And they, they would do it by a law, you know, cowboys. They would, we didn't have trains. There would be large uh, movements of cattle to certain markets. So the same thing, you might be somebody uh, taking your cattle somewhere. If they ended up eating in a forest, one of the Tanaim Yoshua made with all of Klai Yisrael, is you couldn't be mockpit if somebody ate from your forest. That's number one. Two, Efshar lulaket etzim misadeh chaveiro v'chein asavim v'machal behema. You could gather firewood from your neighbor's field. Also grass 
to feed your animals, except if it was a, a special kind of field called a Svetilson that was gro grown a certain kind of expensive item that uh, would damage uh, the, the, the leaves uh, too much. Third, Esher Liktom Bad Mina Ila Lita Olaharki Veemshuk Labala Ila Hakbidalza. You could take a branch wherever you were of a fruit tree, take the branch to, be, to graft it to your own tree. And the owner of the tree could not object. Obviously, all these laws are being put into place to create a feeling of achdus within Klai Yisrael. Even though you've been given this, certain things were made public. Then, ma'ayan ha'yotzei betchila, zeri se'yotzei mechadash, the kol shekein, ma'ayanot, ushmaim shemimot Yoshua. So any Jew was able to take water from any spring, no matter where it was, just because it was on your land, it was an ancient spring that came from a certain water source, you could not deny your fellow Jew access to that water. Fifth, Mechakin the Yamashal Tveria. You could go fishing in the Kinneret, even though the Kinneret was in Shevet Naftali's area. Everyone could fish in the Kinneret. You couldn't lay out very big nets with, with, with uh, stakes. Um, that you couldn't do in the Kinneret. Because that would prevent boats from being able to navigate properly in the Kinneret. But anyone could go fishing if they wanted to, even though the, the Kinneret was in the Shevet Naftali's region. Six. Um, people were allowed to travel through somebody else's field to gain access to your field to get a shortcut to your field when you're going to harvest it. That's called Shvile Harishus. And Yoshua made it mind that people should not be mocked with one on the other. That's at a certain point in the year. But once the second rain after Yud Zayin Mar Cheshvan fell, you couldn't do that anymore. Because then there were seeds planted in people's field. And if you walked on it, it would damage it. So it gave a certain time frame when you could take shortcuts through people's field. After Yud Zayin Cheshvan, you could not do that anymore. Ernie. Yes. Um, so I'll ask you later. Keep going, keep going. No, on these tonight? Yeah, I mean, does that, these are only for passerbys. They don't affect somebody who lives next door to somebody else. He can't let his animal, animal go graze in his neighbor's fields. Can he? This is only for passerbys from one shaver to another shaver. I assume, I don't know. No, what, no, no. What does that mean? All the fields are open for everybody? Yeah. So there was there was no after the lockade eight C no after the lockade eight C Mister Chavero eight means like let's say you see firewood yeah you could go and get some firewood or you could get grass you couldn't pat you couldn't put you couldn't allow your animal to go there but let's say there was cut grass I guess you could get some grass from there from Michael Behema except for a Sdet Tilson so there's no private property or you can't yeah, fence your property in. So Sydney, it's exact. What we're seeing from all of this is there was a certain socialistic, or let's call it a communistic, or some kind of commune concept. It wasn't pure; it was private property. But these specific things you could you could not be mocked in. It's not everything. You could, somebody can't come onto your property and build a house there. I, I've been very specific. What the Gemara, what the Gemara and Boba Kama says that you're allowed to do. For example, you could go in an, in an orchard, in a, in a forest, it says you can't stop somebody from going into your forest. 
and then you can get the eight sim, and you can get grass for Michael Behem. So what if thousands of people are doing that? It's not like one. It's like let's say thousands are doing it. There wasn't the the concept of private property that was established by John Locke and the social contract that we're that we are familiar with. That's not the tznaim that Yoshua set up. Okay. What is it? What is ish tachas gafnoi? Yes, ish tachas tenos of ish tachas gafno. Sydney, yes. somebody can't somebody can't come into your property and build their house there. The Yoshua didn't give them that tonight to do that. But they can eat his fruits off his trees there. No, it didn't. No, it didn't oh, say they that. could just said, eat his grass. No, it said you could take you could cut off a branch of a fruit tree, and because you're going to use it to grafting it, that doesn't mean you can take his tree. Okay. But your animals can eat their grass, and then the next person's animals can eat the grass. It's even worse. Eat the grass. It's even worse, you can graft and, and copy and, and steal. <laughs> yep, yep, that's why, I lo that's why I wanted to learn these, because we're not really familiar with this. All right. right. I, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't familiar with this. No, no. And, and the, this is from Boba Kama. It's just like the Chinese. That's what they're doing now. Right, it's exactly the Chinese system. You only, but again, only you could, as I said, like, you could take a shortcut through through somebody else's field up until you design Cheshvam. Right, okay. And that's and pretty that? much, that's, that's pretty much, and basically the Musra Nevi'im says something very, very, very interesting. You know, in the French or the English or the Greeks, they all established their nation in countries where they didn't have to chase anybody out, that they were there naturally. Somehow, Kla Yisrael, Avram Avinu came from Aram Narayim. So why didn't he give them the land there where Avram came from? No, he said, you're gonna have to go and battle and get rid of these seven nations. And that, that's, so ask the Muslim of Vim, Yesh Lish Lo Am Yisrael. HaKadosh wants the Jewish people to feel that they are one unit in the world. Each person has to see themselves as a limb of the body. If everybody was just on their land and inherited from their father, inherited from their father, going back, they would never experience this unifying concept. Finally, later on, they establish a nation. Who cares? I, I was on this land 500 years before this nation was established. Klai Yisrael was only able to inherit the land of Canaan because they all did it together as one unit. This land became the inheritance of the whole nation. This is an answer to what Sydney was querying. This way, we understand why you have to be mavater. You have to give up from yourself to your neighbor if there's going to be a loss to your neighbor. You and your neighbor, you're both limbs from the same body. That was the purposes of these tonight, to invest this notion that we are one nation. It's not a group of individual people coming in and, and, and grabbing their land. We couldn't have done it without the whole nation as a claw, and that's the way it remains. Ernie, how does that differ from, what is the purpose of Shemitah then? 
where the land, uh, you're not supposed to work the land, but anybody's able to go and, and take things, right, uh, from, from... Well, uh, Shemitah, yes, good. Shemitah is something between Adam and uh, Everything Yoshua dealt with is between Adam and Chavero, all these Tnoi. But just like we have six days of work, and then we have Shabbos, because Hashem created... The, so Shemitah is the same concept that there's six days of, you know, six years, and then the seventh year, it's supposed to lie folly, it's supposed to have a moon on Bitochem and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Same, that, so that's a different, uh, that there's certain dinim that everything is hefker, people can go, because it's, that takes away also the concept of pure private property. Loans are wiped away. There's a shmatas ksafim. If I owe somebody, unless you do a prusbul, unless you go give your note to Bezdin, you can't collect on a note after Shemitah passes. So in a sense, it's the same concept in a way for you to realize that uh, the country doesn't belong to you completely. It's, it's a cloud. I understand, but it, again, you're taking a disincentive to work, right? If it, anybody can utilize the, uh, the, uh, the benefits of your labor, why would anybody want to work hard to, to produce more? Unless it's really benign. Well, no, you're not being... Uh, you're not, it's, uh, everybody, yeah. lives, everybody else. Through. Yoshua didn't talk about taxation here. The only that. taxation we have, we know, Meiser Rishon, Meiser Shane, you have to give to the truth. You have to give Truma. It wasn't very high tax. It was 20% taxes. It's not very high. Look at... And, and remember, in years one, two, and years four and five of the Shemitah cycle, the second Meiser belonged to you. Meister Shani, you took up the fruits and the produce. So really, Meister Rishon to the Levi was only 10%. To the Kohen is a 150th, is 2%. So your taxes were 12%. And then in the third and sixth year of the Shemitah cycle, the second Meister you had to give to the Aniyah. So at most, it was 20%. That's, that's what taxation was. Now, there's Matnos Kahuna. You know, there, there's other things you have to give, add-on. but not very much. What was that? No, add-ons, add-on things. There was some, yeah, but in percentage- Voluntary. Wise, voluntary, and you didn't have to eat meat. If, if you didn't give, if you didn't eat meat, you didn't give the, uh, you know, the, the, the keva and the lechayayim, you, you know. So that was all a rishus, uh, uh, like almost a sales tax. But, right. but overall taxation was not high. Okay. Now we come to the next parent. And again, I want to read. We didn't finish. Oh. You didn't finish the 10 things. You were up to seven. No, I, 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 I included a, there are a, a couple, couple of compound nine. Uh, okay. Now those are the main, those are the main nine that, that Baba Kama brings that we discussed. Okay. Yeah. Now, we're going to start Parachat Bays. But I want to give a little introduction. Again, this is from Steinsatz. Yoshua ends his career by fulfilling the charge, implementing God's promise to his people. He has conquered the kings of Canaan, provided the tribes with their inheritance, he has allocated cities of refuge, and he's designated the cities for the Levite. Now the time has come to release the vanguard of Israel's army soldiers from the tribes of Reuven, Gad, and half of Manasseh, who have spent 14 years waging war together with Yoshua and Klai Yisrael, while their families and possessions remained far away by Abra Yarde, right? Bashan, Gilad. So after commending these soldiers, Yoshua instructs them not to forget the legacy of Moshe. He gives them a bracha before they return to their families. He sends them back to their tribal territory east of the Jordan, successfully ending the task imposed upon him by his teacher Moshe. Right? Moshe was the one who accepted the, their, their desire to stay on Abraham Yardin, except you've got to go in with Klai Yisrael to fight. And now it's up to Yoshua to send them back. The members of these tribes construct a large mizbeach, a large altar on their way home. This arouses the suspicions of the, of the other clients who are living on the western side of the Jordan, that their brethren may be initiating new religious rituals and abandoning the worship of God. The conclusion of this section 
deals with the people's awareness of and reaction to the possible threat of a split among them. These Western tribes send dignified emissaries to inquire about the construction of the altar. They were ready to go to war with them. The two and a half tribes of the Eastern side respond by clarifying their positive intentions. So this gives us a little overview of what this parak is going to tell us. Az Yikra Yoshua Leruveni Vlagadim. Yoshua calls to the Ruveni Vlagadim Vlachatsi Matem Nasheh. Remember, half of the tribe of Nasheh is going to stay on the western side, and half is going to be on the eastern side. Vayon Ralehem, Atem Shmartem Et Kol Asher Tzivayetchem. You fulfilled everything that was commanded. Moshe Eved Hashem. But Tishmu Bekoli, and you listen to me. Bechol Asher Tzivayetchem. You did not leave your brothers when they did battle. Until today. Some of the some of the Mephorshim explain that's why it says, "As ye cry, Yoshua." Now Yoshua called them, meaning they could have left seven years ago. Seven years after seven years, they already finished conquering. These tribes could have gone back seven years ago, but they waited around until all the rest of Kli Yisrael were settled in their land. Now, Az Kara Yoshua, and they're going to get praised for doing that, for not rushing back. Hashem now has settled your brothers, and now now you can go back to your own tents. El Eretz Achuzatchem. Go back to where you remember you left your 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 chil, your children, your wives. By the way, we're gonna have a medrash calculation that uh, that if you count how many people were in Ruvain and God alone, when Pinchas counted them, they had eighty-four thousand people between the age of twenty and sixty. Now, in the beginning of Sefer Yoshua. It told us that this vanguard of the main soldiers, Reuven and God, who came and fought, were forty thousand. Well, that tells us that that was they were the great fighters. But that means forty-four thousand adult males between the age of twenty and sixty remained behind in also with the wives and the children to protect them and to watch them and all of that. So it wasn't all of the tribes, but maybe half the tribes. Rock Shamruma Ol gives them a warning. La sota mitzvah vet haTorah shetzivatchem. You have to keep the Torah. Now remember, we're going to have a final parak where Yehoshua charges Kla Yisrael that are going to remain in Eretz Canaan. The same charge, like charge to the graduates. Mm -hmm. Yoshua is going to give them a charge also, but these Shvatim are about to go back. So he's, he gives them an independent charge. Keep the Torah. Be careful. And you shall worship him or service him with all of your hearts. So I just, there's a very interesting, uh, the Lev Aaron says, what is the kind, uh, what is, what is this kind of service of the heart? Yoshua Maslam gamli hit palel b'kavana. Kemosh adrochu chazal eze avodah shebelei v'vliom rizu tefillah. You are not going to be able to offer the Tmidim now. You're going to send your Machtis HaShekel to the base of Migdash. But there's no Korbonois in Eivra Yarde. So they have to be very careful, like we do, about Tfila, because that's Avoda Shabalei.
They only had to be in Eretz Yisrael for Ole Regal? And they came for Ole Regal, yes. Just like the people in Bavel. No Ole Regal. There were no Ole Regal because there was no Yerushalayim uh, yet. But they did come to Shiloh for 369 years. Bernie, they, did, they made Aliyah to Shiloh. Shiloh was like the base of Migdash for 369 years. Remember, Bernie, we're going to eventually, we're going to read, uh, uh, we're going to read Sefer Shmuel, Perak Aleph. Remember, Elkanah comes right. with his wives. So they made Aliyah to regal to Mishkan, to Eliyah Cohen, to Mishkan Shiloh. Right. So they, they, there was Aliyah, there was Aliyah regal from these lands. And if you lived somewhere else, eventually when the Ole Bavel would also come up and make uh, Aliyah regal three times a year. I just, it just, there was a, there's a medrash that says that, he, you know, he told him about tefillah. Then says, Vayibarchem Yoshua, Vayishalchem, Vayelchu Elohim. Yoshua blessed them and he sent them to go back. Oh. Now, Perek Zayin. L'chatsi Shevet Amnashe. Pasuk. I'm sorry, Pasuk Zayin. L'chatsi Shevet Amnashe, Natan Moshe Babashan. U'lechatsiyo Natan Yoshua Machei, Amei Vayardin, Yama. So the Pasuk reminds us, Shevet Benashe, Half of it is giving a is being given the chelik in the Bashan, which is remember near the near the Golan Heights, which was conquered from Og Melech Bashan, and some of Menashe is going to stay on the west side of the Jordan. He spe, he sends them a special bracha. He gives them a very big bracha of Gashmias. The Kesev, Zav, Nechoshes, Barzel, silver, gold, copper, iron. You should make sure to make sure that you, you, you give the booty to your brothers that were there still. So the, the Radak and the Ramban learn that the, the Menashe was addressed already when he addressed Ruven Bagat. But others say, no, that this was strictly to Menashe. Because if you go back and you look at Parsha Matos Masse, where the Bnei God and the Bnei Ruvain come to Moshe, Menashe doesn't come to ask for anything. Only Ruvain and God asked. They had Mikne Rab. They wanted to stay. Eventually, Yoshua attaches Shevet, half of Shevet Menashe to them for a special reason. Menashe is going to be the link. Half of Menashe is going to stay in Canaan. Half of Nasha is going to be with Ruven and God, and they're going to be the link to always keep them reminding, oh, you know, you're really part of Klai Yisrael and Eretz Kanat. And, and they're given a special bracha, uh, particularly of, of Parnasa, because they didn't ask for anything. So they were given spoils. Ruven and God were not entitled to spoils, you know, when they did battle, but the Menashe were entitled to spoils because they didn't ask for anything when, when they, you know, only Reuben and God had asked for Moshe. That's how the Mephorshim explain why there's a special bracha here for Menashe. Vayashuvu, Perek Tes. Vayashuvu vayalchu b'nei Reuben v'nei God v'chatsi shevet ab n'ashem me'ep ne Yisrael m'shiloh asher be'eretz k'nat. Remember, they were all in Shiloh. That's where the Chalukah took place. So the tribe, these two tribes leave Shiloh to try to head back to the east of the Jordan. Now, there's some Midrashim that say that Yoshua went with them all the way to the Jordan. And then Yoshua headed back. But then they didn't want Yoshua to go back alone. So Reuben and God accompanied again Yoshua back <coughs> until eventually Yoshua says, we, we could do this back and forth, back and forth forever. And Yoshua finally sends him back, but he gives him a special bracha. They bring some chazalim that the Talmud of Rav Shimon ben Yochai was the same thing. That means if your Rebbe gives you a bracha and sends you home, but for example, let's say you have to stay another day 
you shouldn't go back home until you go back to your Rebbe for second bracha. They learn it from this episode with Yoshua. And maybe if we get to it, I'll, I'll learn that, that message with everybody. Now, they reach a certain part called the Glilota Yardain. There's a machloka. Some say it's the area of Gilgal near, in the tribe of Yehuda. Some say it's the boundary of Binyamin. But it's the general name for the Jordan Valley. Asher Beretz Kanan. It's still on the western side. They build a very big Mizbeach. On uh, which side? On the western <laughs> side. On the western side. But that's not on the eastern side. On the west bank. On the west bank, yes. They have not crossed over to the east Jordan yet. They build it on the western side of the Mizbeach. A big but that, one. But that's not their land. So hang on. So they build a Mizbeach there, a big one, not a normal Mizbeach. Vaishmuvne Israel more. The tribes of Israel heard Yine Banuvne Ruvenuvne God, the Khatsi Shep of Shed of Mizbeach, El Mul Eretz Knan, El Glota Yardin, El Abrebne Israel. Vaishmuvne Israel, Vaikaluk, Ladabe Sol Shilo Lalot, Alayam at Sava. Klaisro believes they were given Lush and Hara that they are now going to offer korbanos. Now, remember we learned, once the Mishkan was established in Shiloh, you're mm -hmm. not allowed to offer any korbanos anywhere else. So the initial thought is that they're going to be offering korbanos on the Mizbeach, and, and now they see a pirud. There's now like internal strife. What are they doing? So, Vayishlechu bnei Yisrael al bnei Ruven al bnei Gad al Chatzis Shevet Nashel Eretz Akilad et Pinchas ben Alazar Kohen. They send a delegation. Who heads the delegation? Our old friend Pinchas. Pinchas, the son of Elazar. Now, why Pinchas? So Midrashim. So number one, Pinchas was the Meshuach Melchama. Right. We have two. Kohanim that served somewhat as a Kohen Gadol. One is the Kohen, one he wears eight Begadim, but he works in the base of Mikdash. Another Kohen Gadol also wears eight Begadim, but he leads Klai Yisrael into battle. Chazal tell us that Pinchas was the first Meshuach Muhammad. So because Klai Yisrael now wanted to do battle with Ruven and God, because they think they're rebelling, they're building a Mizbeach, with them, but they shouldn't. That's one shot. Another shot is Pinchas was given as Grisi Shalom. Even though he did an act of radical kanos, of radical jealousy, right? He saw Zimri, who was the, uh, he saw uh, the, the Nasi of Shimon, having relations with Cosby Basur by Midian, and he killed both of them. And, and, but it stopped the Magaifa, and it created Shalom in Klai Yisrael. It, it, it stopped the rift. So he's a man of peace. It's strange, because he's a, he's a Kanoi, but he was given Brisi Shalom. So yeah, but, here now, Pinchas needs to make Shalom. And yeah, that's, but didn't they, didn't, wasn't part of it that uh, Pinchas would maybe scare them if they had like uh, uh, bad intentions with that Mizbeya? I mean, I think they were misunderstood uh, what Reuven and God did, but right, right, that's right. So right now they don't, they don't. Right now they're sending a delegation right. headed by Pinchas, and some of them were prepared for war. Each tribe sent a Nasi, right? Because there are 10 tribes, nine and a half. So Menashe also sent. These are the nine tribes that live on the western side of the Jordan. Nasi Israel. 
They came to the Eretz Agilad. They had built the Mizbeach and they got to their homes. What kind of treachery are you doing with Klai Yisrael? That you're going against Hashem. You are building the Mizbeach and not allowed to do. We already had a chet uh, bal peor. Bilam, after failing to curse Klai Yisrael, advised Balak to uh, get all the benos midyan, the, the women, to go out and offer themselves for sexual immorality with Klai Yisrael. The way they did it was through Avodah Zarah. They said, oh, you want, to have, you want to have relations with me? You have to worship this Avodah Zarah. So the, the Avodah Zarah, that's how they got them to worship Avodah Zarah. What Avodah Zarah was, it was Baal Peor. Baal Peor was an Avodah Zarah where you actually went to the bathroom in front of the idol. That's how revolting this Avodah Zarah was. So they he, they remind I'm at Lanot Avon Peor Asher Lo Itanu Imen Ariyom. We still haven't purified ourselves from it, and it really led to a Magefa Vayanegef Vadat Hashem Vatem Tashuv Ayom Achri Hashem. You are also turning away from Hashem. Vayah Tem Timuru Ayom Hashem Umachar El Kodat Esro Yitzov Hashem will be angry. Vaachim Tmeya Eretz Achuzat Hashem Ivru Lachem El Eretz Achuzat Hashem Asher Shachan Shem Yishkan Hashem. You are violating, I build, you, you, you are adding a Mizbech to the Mizbech that's in Shiloh. Hello, Achan ben Zerach. If you remember, right. when they conquered the eye, took the spoils. Achan was the one person who took the spoils. But there was anger against Klai Yisrael. And that was just one person. You are two tribes. So this was a very sharp rebuke by the Nisim against uh, Ruven Begad. Now, they were completely misunderstood. Kel el kim Hashem hu yodea. We believe in Hashem. Vi Yisrael hu yeda in the merit and the mal Hashem al to shayim azim. If we are revolting, we should. If we are revolting against Hashem, we should never have any success. Leave not lanu mizbeach l'shuv makre Hashem chas v'shom. That we are building this mizbeach to revolt. Im lalos alav olam in chavim lasot alav zivcheshem. We have no intention. Of putting any korbanot on this mizbeach Hashem we vakesh. The imlomi dagami davar sinu etzot lemor. There was a reason we didn't want to worry about our future generations. Machay yomru bnei chel vanenu lemor. Our children will ask, Malachem l'Hashem l'ked. What do you, living on the east side of the Jordan, have anything to do with Klal Yisrael? Ugvul natan Hashem beinenu beinechem bnei ruvei bnei gad et kiyardim. There's this river Jordan. You have no connection with the Klai Yisrael. And our children will get lost from worshipping Hashem. So we said to ourselves, not for Korbanos. We're building it as a witness. And between us and our future generations. Our regular korbanos that we're going to send to Mishkan Shiloh. So our children will understand that we have a deep connection. Later on, our children are going to ask our later progeny. Look at what they built here. Lola Ola blows up, not for a korban ki edu beinenu beinechem, is a witness, a testimony. Chalil alanu mimenu limrod ba'ashem, v'lashuv ayom achri ha'ashem, l'ibnot mizbeach, v'olalu mizbeach, v'olalu mizbeach. We're not building this mizbeach for korbanis. 
מלבד מזבח השם, לוקנו אשר לפני משכנו, except for what's in משכן שילה. Aside from. <clears throat> Can I make a comment? Sure. Yeah, I mean, this is, the parak starts out by Yoshua thanking them for spending 14 years away from their family and, and to help their, their brethren <coughs> in the other nine and a half tribes. As soon as they start back, uh, suddenly all the Nisim from all the other tribes decide they're violating it and they're rebelling and we're going to go fight against them for, for which was obviously a misunderstanding because they explained that they had no intention to do carbonas. Where is the Avas, uh, uh, the, the Avas B'nai Yisrael, Ishle Re'el? Where is it? Why is it? In a minute it disappears. Don what did you do for me today? Lush, it was Loshna Kibben Sheyesh Bali Loshna Haru. It was Sinas uh, Dinam. It was Lashon Haro. And and Yoshua didn't know, but they didn't. Yoshua didn't know yet that they built a Mizveah. Eventually, he was told. That's why they they sent the delegation. Right. By the way, says the man Loez, There were three aspects of this thing they built. That should have shown anybody who saw it that had nothing to do with Korbanot. First of all, they built it like Sydney asked. They built it actually in the west side of the Jordan. They would have built it where they lived. That's number one. It was huge. Even as the same korbanot, why you want to make a gadol kol kach? Vaod asu a knisa vayetzer shem isbeir klape eretz Israel. It was a, it was this, the way they built it archaeologically. I mean, uh, architecturally, was this concept of the connection between where they lived and Klai Yisrael. I saw where there was no entrance to the eastern side. The uh, entrance and the exit were all on the western side of the Mizbeah. It was all, it was, everything was on the western side. Now, now, we have to, like, I think a little bit, the Me'am Loez is asking Bernie's question. Yesh lachem litmoa. Mara u Yisrael atzeit the milchama lachem al davar zeh. Offering a korban outside of Shiloh is a law that you get Malkus for. It's not, uh, it's not worshiping up at a Zara. Let's say they had built it for korbanos. It's not the word, it's a law that you get Malkus for. It's not a law that has Misa. Says the Me'am Loes. So, we know that there are three Averot, three sins, cardinal sins, that you are supposed to give up your life rather than, rather than uh, violate those sins. Giloy Arai, Shvichos Domim, Giloy Arai, Savarazar. Means if somebody points a gun at your head and says, "You need to kill that guy, or I will kill you," you have to allow yourself to be killed. Same thing with Avodah Zara. Same thing. If somebody says, "I want you have to sleep with that person who's, a, who's a, for, forbidden to you," and if you don't, I'm going to kill you. You have to allow yourself to be killed. But those are the only three averus that we have like that. Other, let's say that here, I'm going to here eat this piece of chazer, or I'm going to shoot you. So you're allowed to eat the piece of chazer. It's not Yaharag Val Yavor. Only those three, you're supposed to allow yourself to be killed rather than, rather than violate those transgressions. However, there's a caveat to that rule. The caveat that, to that rule is, if someone tells you to eat the chazer in public, Bifarhesya, then, that, then there's something called Chilul Hashem, and you're allowed, you have to allow yourself to be killed for that as well. Even for even for a regular lav, not one of the Gimel Averis.
And that's basically what the Mamluks is saying here. This was not only this was before Hesse, this was two of the Shvatim of the, of the 12 Shvatim were going against a Lav Torah. That's why, that's one of the reasons why they, they had, they created such a, uh, uh, such a, such a big rush over this. So what, what happened? Vaishma Pinchas HaKohen, Unesiei HaDav Roshel Feisro HaSherito, Et HaDvarim HaSher Dibru Bnei Ruvenu Bnei Gad of Neim HaShem, Ayitav Beineihem. They accepted. Vayomer Pinchas Mazar Kohen of Bnei Ruvenu Bnei Gad of Neim HaShem, Hayom Yadanu Kibetocheinu HaShem. You are with us, and HaShem is with you. Asher Lom Altem HaShem Amal HaShem. As the Tzaltem of Yisrael Yad HaShem. And therefore, you're saving Klai Yisrael, because otherwise, like Achan, we would have trouble. They gave up their notion to fight them. They called it aid. They called him Izbeach Eid. I just wanted to read you the Chazal that I mentioned before. Uh, uh, when was it destroyed, you know? Did you say? Uh, you mean what this Mizbeach? Well, How long did it last? No drawings, okay. no pictures, no okay. descriptions. So, so, I don't have an archaeological discussion regarding that, but we're going to talk about what happened to the Bnei Ruven of Bnei Gad on the east side of the Jordan. Well, mm -hmm. they were taken away by Sancheiriv first, right? In the year 702 CE, about 130 years before the destruction of, Yush of the base of Migdash in Yushalayim by Nebuchadnezzar, Sancheiriv, Melech Ashur, came and took the 10 northern tribes in exile. But remember, Reuben and God were on the east side. They were taken first. They were the first tribes lost, even before the other tribes, the northern tribes besides Yehuda and Binyamin, mm -hmm. because Assyria comes from the east, northeast. So the Re Reuben and God were lost very quickly. That's good. Uh, but I'm going to go back to that. I want to read this. Uh, notice, notice in Pasuk Lamed, it says, Vaishma Pinchas HaKohen. Why, why didn't it just say Vaishma Pinchas Eda? So in Gemara Zvachim, Daf Kufalif, it says, Omra Mullah's Ram of Khanina, Loni Sky and Pinchas, Achahar Gulazimri. Remember, there were supposed to be only four Kohanim Nadav Aviu, Elazar Vitomer. Four children of Aaron. Now, none of Aviyu died. So he had Elazar and Itamar. Only children of Elazar and Itamar were supposed to be Kohanim. Now, Pinchas is the son of Elazar, but it's going to be, I, at that time, I think it's only, anyways, Pinchas only had the right to become a Kohen, says the Gemara, after he killed Zimri. However, Ravashi Omar Ad Shasham Ad Shasam Sholon Ben Ashvati, Shneimer Vayishma Pinchas Hakohen Uzi Aidav Roshel Pe Israel. Because over there, the Enku Hu Naksuv El Baal Azar, the Kan Ksuv Be Pinchas, Achar Shasham Sholon Ben Ashvati. So this was an important moment for Pinchas, because according to Chazal, in order for Pinchas' children to be Miyachis, his children after him as Kohanim, because it could be that it wouldn't have continued unless he got but the special grace. Up, up until now, it, was, it would have ended by Pinchas. But here it, it cost him a Kohen, so you know it's him. Because everywhere else it refers to his father as the Kohen, not him.
So did the Tamar's children... Uma, and, uh, hang on. I want to read what the Musar Nevi'im says. So according to Ravashi, remember Ravashi is the final redactor of the Talmud. So finally, when Ravashi, Ravashi didn't agree that, that uh, Pinchas was Niskai when he killed Zimri. That it was only, he only became a coin after this episode. So the Musa Ravim says, why didn't it happen after Zimri? It says eventually the land dried up from the from the water. This is by Briasa Ola. But, uh, I'm sorry, this is by the Mabu. A person should never benefit from something that starts from a curse. So the Musa Rabim says, Perhaps that's why the Zchus for Kahuna didn't come to him when he killed Zimri. He, he couldn't really benefit from the fact that Zimri was killed. You can't really get a full brach out of Klola. Here, when he made Shalom, nobody died, nobody was killed, there was no Klola. As I arrived on us, the Lakabu was as as Kesra Kuhuna. That's what the Musa Rabim wants to say that it's from this Misa of Shalom uh, in Kla Yisrael that Pinchas was able to, to to become a coin. Yes, Sydney? It's a good shot. I like the shot. Yeah, it's a nice shot, right? Yes. So Ernie, I'm just, could you make a clarification, Ernie? The, are you saying from this point on, it only Pinchas' children continued on in the Kahuna, and the rest, no. or just the uh, Kohen God, the line, lineage of Kohen God, though? No, no, it would have stopped after Pinchas, but his Zaro would not have continued. And what about only, only other, only the children of Elazar be Tomar, I guess, would have continued in that line, and not not Pinchas. They had other children. So the, but the fact that now Pinchas's future children would also be called Kohanim, that happened because of this. Why would he have, why would he have forfeited the Kahuna had he not done this? Why no, it's not going to have forfeited it. Only a Lazar Itomar were, were made Kohanim. Correct. I'm asking, my question is why would he have lost that he was one of the children of El Lazar if he had multiple sons? They all would have been Kohanim. Why would he be disqualified? Is it because he, he killed Zimri? No, and just the opposite. No, just the opposite. So, no, maybe, maybe it was only, um, maybe it was only some children of Elazar, the Itamar, maybe the Bechor, or only certain designated children of Elazar, not all their children, would become Kohanim after them. But Pinchas got an independent right that his children would also become Kohanim because of the, either because of the action of Zimri. But it's not that, the, in fact, the first shot in the Gemara is that the killing of Zimri is, the, what, is what gave him his kuhun. Ravashi doesn't accept it. He says, no, it's this case where he made Sholem by the Reuven and God. And that the way I explained the, in the Musra Nevi'im is because the act of Zimri, that's a killing act. And a, a, a bracha can't come out of the club. Here there was no, here there was no club at all. So it seems to me as if the Musa Haskell from this parak is, uh, don't go on the basis of first judgment, uh, first impression. And, and Pinchas was, had the, uh, work, the, uh, the understanding that he needed to investigate first. We're all guilty of me, often taking first impressions and, and making judgments quickly. And Absolutely. Is, that's not the derech to, to follow. Absolutely. Did Nadav, did Nadav and Avihu have sons that were Kohanim? 
I don't think none of Avia were married. So Kohanim only come from Elazar and Itamar. And Pinchas. And Pinchas. And, and only from certain children of Elazar and Itamar, like we pointed out, because Pinchas was already the, the child of Elazar. I wanted to, again, Rabbi Hatton, uh, who we've been using a lot uh, in our understanding of Sefer Yeshua, he gives us also a good understanding of this overall, this Reuben and God business, which I wanted to discuss. If you look in the Parshiot by, by Reuben and God in, in Parshas Bamidbar, you see that they were very, very hesitant. They had a lot of flock. And they wanted to stay on the Abra Yardin. But the Abarbanel says, initially these tribes voiced their appeal. They were ashamed to state it explicitly. Therefore, the text of the Torah introduces a paragraph division after their first statement. If you look in the Parsha, there's a, there's a stuma. They come, and they, 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 they begin a little bit to explain the motion. You know, we have a lot of flock. They don't really come out right out and say what they want. Moshe understood what, what they were trying to get at, but he didn't chastise them right away. He remained silent to allow them to first openly divulge their request. They were forced to ask with greater direction. So that's why it says there a second time, okay, we want to stay Abraham Yard. Now, why were they reluctant? Well, Reuben and God were not stupid. They know that 38 years, 38 years before, remember the Miraglim came, and, and all of a sudden, the Kleisro didn't want to go into Eretz Yisrael. And now here they're coming, so we don't want to go into Eretz Yisrael. So they were very hesitant in what they said. So Moshe, of course, chastises them and says, listen, you know, what are you trying to do? You're trying to, you know, make, make the people weak again. So... The, the, those tribes came with their own idea to say, you know, we will build corrals for our flock and we will build cities for our families and then we're going to go fight. They would fight with their brothers and Moshe acquiesced and he made them take a shavua. Now at the end, they're fulfilling this oath. and. But now they build this, uh, this Mizbeah, right? And the clients will interpret their act as an invitation to idolatry, as an attempt to set up an alternate center of worship to rival the newly built national shrine at Shiloh. This is very much a parallel to what had happened two decades earlier when Reuven and God now calm the people and say, no, you didn't understand. We really have, we want, we are believers in Hashem and we have nothing to do. So there's a, there's sort of a symmetry with what happened over there. And the same thing with Menashe. Moshe Rabbeinu intentionally selected Menashe with care. Because Moshe was fearing that Reuben and God were going to abandon the national destiny. So he considered it, Moshe considered it carefully, and he said, we're going to limit the danger. We're going to send some of Anasha east of the Jordan, and the bulk of the tribe will stay west of the Jordan. And this was a mechanism to preserve a cohesive connection between all the tribes on both sides. The bulk of Manasseh's descendants would remain within Canaan, and there would be powerful tribal bonds that are a function of shared culture, language, and history, and that would ensure a strong link to be maintained with the families to the east. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Ibn Ezra tells us that Yair ben Menashe was really from the tribe of Yehuda, uh, whose mother was from Menashe. So they were trying to mix up 
the, the tribes here to keep people together as one club. Now, even though, even though they, they made all these attempts during the hundreds of years, during the period of Shoftim and the Malachim, Reuven and God remained involved, but it wouldn't be preserved. Reuven, was, Reuven and God were exiled to the, as, to the distant lands by the Assyrians, never to be heard again. And the Medrash in Medrash Rabbah says, the tribes of God and Reuven were wealthy and had many flocks. Because of their love of their possessions, they decided to dwell outside the land of Israel. Therefore, they were exiled before any of the other tribes. What brought this fate upon them? The fact that they separated themselves from their brethren because of their wealth. Because it says the tribes of Reuben and God had immense flocks. So the most sincere oaths of allegiance, the most moving of monuments and memorials, even taking an active part in fighting in the people's wars, cannot create a shared destiny with those that dwell in the land. The Ralbad finally gives us a lesson, which this Israel setting of a delegation consisting of Pinchas and the tribal elders. Like Bernie said, this was in order to investigate the truth of the matter before attacking them. Even concerning things that require an urgent response, it is critical that one reflect and investigate the matter. Look what would have happened had such an investigation not taken place. Great harm would have ensued had the people of Israel attacked their brethren. That's what the Rabbah says at the end of Sefer Yoshua. But uh, even though it ends tragically, because Reuben and God are lost to us, and disagreements between the Shvatim have a long history, uh, there are lessons, dialogue, allowing the two and a half tribes to explain their motivations, even while justifiably suspecting the worst. Moshe and later Yoshua introduce the tribes of Israel to a new dynamic. Discussion, words. This replaces warfare, and compromise is the goal. So we are going to see in the last two Prokim and Yoshua, basically Yoshua gives us a valedictory address, like uh, George Washington gives a farewell address uh, when he leaves uh, the presidency. And that will come, that will, uh, we will deal with uh, in the next few weeks. What time is it? It's 9-11. Oh, I went too long. Okay. It's very interesting. They, their whole history was, you know, full of these um, other situations that came up. Right, right. So they were they they were susceptible to the lush and horror that was that was told to them. Yeah. Ernie on the side.